Perhaps the first and most intuitive way we might get rid of those negative signs is just ignoring them altogether. And instead of using a deviation, what if we used an absolute deviation? Now, it turns out that this was argued for quite strongly by somebody we've already met before, Sir Arthur Eddington. You might recall that he was the one who, in 1919, actually observed the apparent shift in a star and confirmed Einstein's general theory of relativity. About five years earlier, in 1914, Eddington wrote about the absolute deviation and its use in statistics. Statistics and astronomy actually share a pretty large history. So Eddington was arguing that the absolute deviation would be the best way or the most efficient way to actually measure spread. And remember, we're trying to measure spread here in the service of capturing that important quantity in a distribution. But we're also going to have to use our samples to make inferences back to populations. So whatever statistic we choose here, we want to be the best, that is to have the least error. An idea we'll come back into in just a second. Now, some of you may have realized that there's another way to deal with those negative signs. If we square a negative value, it becomes positive. And so yet another way we can handle those negatives is by considering squared deviations. So not just in removing the negative signs, but actually squaring the deviation for each individual. Now this was argued for by someone else we've already met, Sir Ronald Fisher. Now, Ronald Fisher being the most preeminent statistician in the 20th century, and Arthur Eddington not being a slouch himself, this turned out to be a pretty heated debate. Now, it turned out that Fisher was right, as Fisher tended to be, and in 1920, he wrote a geometric proof, which I'll show you in just a second, for why we should use the squared deviation. But let's step back and actually understand what these individuals were arguing about. Why would they argue about this quantification? Well, remember that we will and eventually be using sample data to make estimates of these population parameters. That is, we won't have access to mu, but we will have our sample mean. And so in our samples, we're going to be taking the deviations of our individuals to our sample mean and then operating on those deviates. Now remember, all statistics have sampling error, that discrepancy that will always exist between our sample statistic from our small sample and the true population parameter. And so in our sample, those X bars will have error. We won't be taking deviations from a true value. What Fisher was able to show in his 1920 publication was that the squared deviation was actually a better estimate of the population squared deviation than using the absolute deviation. Now this actually referred to a specific property of an estimator called efficiency. Now let's take a slight sidestep and talk about the properties we hope estimators have. Now remember, what we're talking about here are statistical estimators, mathematical procedures we do on samples in the service of knowing something about a population. So we've already seen an estimator, the sample mean. The sample mean is an estimator of the population mean. It turns out that it uses the exact same formula and exact same operations, but that's what it is. It is an estimate that we form from sample data to figure out something about a population. Now, the properties we hope estimators have start with consistency. We hope that all of our estimators and statistics are consistent statistics, which means that they get better when we have more data. Now, this should be a pretty obvious property. If we have a sample of 100 people and a sample of 10 people, a consistent estimator will be more accurate with 100 people than with 10 people. This is something we assume all estimators should be. Now, the second property of an estimator is relative efficiency. And this turned out to be the characteristic that Arthur Eddington and Ronald Fisher were arguing about. Efficiency asks whether the statistic errs less than other estimators trying to estimate the same thing. And notice that with the squared deviation and the absolute deviation, we're really interested in the same basic thing, the variability of a distribution. But the question is, over repeated samples, does one do better than the other in actually guessing about the population parameter? We'll come back to that one. Now, another property of estimators we care about is sufficiency. Does it use all the data? Now, for instance, the mean is a sufficient statistic. It uses every piece of information in the sample to come up with the value. And that's why the sum of all the deviations is zero. It is really using every value to find the center of mass. Now, the median, on the other hand, is not a sufficient statistic. The median only uses one value, the central value. And all the other values don't really get used in a calculation other than just to find the serial position of the middle value. 
Now efficiency, as I mentioned, was the property that Eddington and Fisher were arguing about. And what Fisher was able to show was that his version of this statistic, the deviation squared, actually was more efficient. It had less error in repeated samples than the absolute deviation. So, after Fisher's 1920 paper, it was pretty much accepted that the squared deviation should be used as the basic unit of variability in statistics. Now, the squared deviation is something we'll see a lot, and something that is used over and over in statistics. And for things that we use often, we like to have shorter terms. So, the squared deviation will often refer to as simply squares. So a square, in this case, is an individual's deviation, so the distance from their point to the mean, squared. Now let's remember what we were doing. We entered into this idea of squaring the deviation because we found that the sum of the raw deviations is always zero. And so we needed to operate on those observations so that we could have a usable quantity. Remember, we're trying to capture some average distance of points to the center. And so if we end up with zero after taking a sum, there's really nothing we can do further. So now, let me take the squares of each of these deviations. So we have our 10 individual squares. The sum of these, however, is a positive number, 12. Now this sum, this sum of square deviations, is also a very important quantity in statistics, and it'll also get its own name, or SS, the sum of square deviations. We'll also call this the sum of squares. So as we go forward, remember what SS stands for. So now that we have our sum of squares and something that is actually positive to work with, we can move forward. We're going to operate on this sum of squares to get our measure of average distance. Now this can be done very simply. If we take the sum of squares, the sum of square deviations, and divide it by n, we'll get a usable quantity. In this case, it'll be 1.2. Now think about what this means. 1.2 units or the average square deviation, the mean square deviation, is actually a measure of spread. In this case, we actually call it the mean square deviation or the population variance. Now the variance is an important quantity in and of itself. It's not the standard deviation, but it's the square of the standard deviation. Notice what this is. This is the average or the actual mean square distance of points to the center. So let me give this to you as a single formula. The variance is just the sum of square deviations, those sum of squares, divided by the number of scores we have. And that will return the mean square distance of scores to the mean. Now, as I said, the variance is an important quantity, and it will get a symbol too. But in fact, it'll simply co-opt the symbol for the standard deviation. In this case, we use sigma and put a square next to it to indicate we're talking about the mean squared distance of scores to the mean. Now with this, we're very close to finding the standard deviation. We know that the standard deviation of a population is sigma, and we know how to take square roots. So, to find the standard deviation, if we have a variance, we simply take the square root. So a standard deviation is always the square root of its variance, and the square of a standard deviation is always the variance. These two can be interoperable and move back and forth. And in fact, they really represent the same underlying thing. A standard deviation and variance all capture deviation of points to the center. One just does it in squared units, the variance, and the standard deviation does it in the original units of our variable. So going back, if that's our population formula for the variance, our population standard deviation is simply the square root of the sum of squares divided by n. Now for simplicity, we'll often refer to this as the average distance of scores to the mean. But remember that it can't be the actual average distance. The average distance of scores to the mean would be a mean absolute deviation. Remember, that's what Eddington was arguing for. Now what we did was square the deviations, take an average, so divide the sum of squares by n, and then we're taking the square root of that mean square deviation. That will not end up being the same thing as simply taking the absolute value of the deviations and taking the mean. Those are different quantities, and of course, they would have to be, otherwise Eddington and Fisher wouldn't have had their five years of arguing. So going back, our 1.2, or our mean squared deviation, if we take the square root, we find out that the standard deviation for that population was 1.095 cups of coffee. And if we go back to the histogram, this should square with our visual intuition. 1.2, 
the distance of these points to the center on average is about 1.095. Again, remember, it's not really the average distance, but rather the square root of the mean squared distance. Now, if we were to calculate the standard deviation of a population by hand, it would be five different steps. First, we would find each deviation score, so the distance of each point to the population mean. We would square each of those deviation scores. Remember, that has its own name. Those are the squares. We would then find the sum of those square deviations. Remember, that has its own term as well, the SS. Then, we would divide the sum of squares by the number of scores we have in that population, which would give us the population variance. And then, to find the standard deviation, we would just take the square root of the result. Now, if we put these all into one formula, we can compress down the information quite a bit. And there it is, the population standard deviation, just the square root of the sum of the squares, so each squared deviation summed, divided by the population size. Now, for convenience, it'll be useful for us to break apart this formula into two steps. First, take the sum of squares, and second, operate on the sum of squares to find the value you want. Notice that to get a variance or to get a standard deviation, we'll always have to find the sum of square deviations. So it's useful to think of the sums of squares as their own thing. And then when we operate on the sum of squares to get the standard deviation, the variance, or any other quantity, we can do that second. 